Coming up next on The Local Show, with summer vacation just around the corner, we'll drop in on a new charter school downtown. Also, we'll celebrate Worlds of Fun's 40th by going coaster crazy with a man who makes model roller coasters. And show you what's in store for this year's celebration at the station with singer Olita Adams. Principal funding for The Local Show provided by Francis Family Foundation, Frederick and Louise Hartwig Family Fund, Kaufman Foundation, Healthcare Foundation of Greater Kansas City, Johnson County Community College, John and Effie Spees Memorial Trust, Bank of America Trustee, Richard J. Stern Foundation for the Arts, Commerce Bank Trustee, and KCPT members, thank you. And I'm Randy Mason. Welcome to The Local Show, where each week we try to live up to our name with stories about this place we call home. This week, you might say the theme is school or what we do when it lets out. We'll start by introducing you to a new charter school that lots of us are just beginning to learn about, the Crossroads Academy. Sponsored by the University of Central Missouri, it's wrapping up its first year in operation, offering grades K through 5. Eventually, they'll expand to K through 8. But despite the name, you won't find it in the Crossroads. This school that embraces what they term 21st century learning is actually smack dab in the middle of downtown. Downtown. We didn't even determine at the very beginning that we were going to be downtown. The original question was, what are the characteristics of the perfect school? And so we talked about that a lot. We toured a lot of schools. And we went to Chicago, to St. Louis. I visited schools in New York and just tried to see what they were, the high performing schools, what were they doing? The basic model for us is that every student is spending every minute of the day with an exceptional teacher studying a rigorous curriculum in a creative and focused classroom. Who did I call next? Elizabeth. Track her. Many of those teachers had worked previously with Ticey and oh, Dean you know at another charter uh, school, Gordon Parks Elementary. They jumped at the opportunity to teach a diverse student body from an ambitious curriculum using what's known as Common Core Standards. And because the school sits literally right behind the Lyric Theater, take full advantage of downtown's cultural and civic amenities. Every day, classes can be seen streaming down Central to take recess at Barney Alice Plaza. Or heading down 10th to visit the Central Library. A heartwarming sight for library director and downtown council member Crosby Kemper III. When we pull the downtown neighborhood association and residents downtown, the one thing they want at the top of the list is a school. The 20-somethings who move downtown for the excitement of downtown end up having little somethings, and, and there's no place for those little somethings to go. And now with Crossroads, we have that. I wasn't sure we'd ever have a school. I was hopeful but I wasn't sure. And when I realized it was happening, it was sort of like a dream come true. It was Phil Kirk's real estate savvy that helped the Crossroads Academy find its home. Currently, they're paying DST a dollar a month for the building, which last housed 360 architecture. The very same building where almost a century ago, a young Walt Disney walked these halls working his first job in the movie business. It's taken considerable renovation. And while there's still not quite what you'd call a gym, even with 190 kids packed inside, this non-traditional space seems to be working. Overtime. The school day here runs from 8 to 4, and that's not all. We have a long school year. We have 194 school days compared to most schools in the state, which are 174 school days. So all totaled, students at Crossroads Academy are going to school 37% more time than what the state requires. People who tour our school say, how are the kids so calm, but your teachers don't have to scream at the kids, you know? Your teachers don't have to 
you know, how they write the name on the board and put a check if they're being naughty or something. They don't have to do that because the kids know here are the rules and the things that they are doing in class, they have a purpose. Students start to have trouble and make poor choices when they don't see value through their work. So today we're going to fold paper and identify that folded edge because it's going to be important where the fold is. I know that the arts were really important to both Dean and Ticey and so I'm a, a full-time art teacher teaching to every class twice a week, which doesn't happen. It's just, it is really important. And that way my fish gets a lot bigger. And so later when we cut that out, I'm not trying to create 190 artists that are going to go on to be art school students in college, but I want them to be able to appreciate it. So much visual stimuli so close by is an art teacher's dream. Not to mention the potential partnerships that develop down here, like the one with the Quality Hill Playhouse, where Crossroads Theater classes are staging their musical, and the Kansas City Ballet. Students visit the Bolander Center weekly for movement training, or even the gallery at the Roastery, which recently hosted a first Friday exhibition of artwork produced by Lisa Gann's classes. We have one of the most highly developed and developing cultural scenes in the United States in downtown Kansas City. You know, it, it, talk about broadening horizons, talking about aspirational. Dean saw that and, and communicated his vision to a lot of us who, who said, amen, brother. We know that kids can show how they learn in drawing and painting and things like that. And so it's not just students have to show how they know things through a certain mode. Kids can show how they know things throughout the school day. Okay, so here are the standards and the skills per quarter, you know. So Here's something most of us have never seen before, a six-page report card. Instead of the usual A's, B's, C's, and D's, the Academy breaks down each subject to specific skills that students must prove they've mastered, all the while stressing to them a quartet of character skills that, in the long run, will help build a better person in and out of the classroom. The teachers do have these data teams and they meet to look at how students are showing growth. And so our teachers have to have team skills and they have to be able to let colleagues help them. You know, it's not like these are my kids and you can't help me. We've been able to create in this very first year a, a critical mass of great educators. And I think one of the things that teachers are very attracted to is that opportunity to work with other great teachers and that opportunity to work with the great principal. So what one of the things we're very proud of is the cost per student that we created this facility for. It's very, very economical. This has been a very cost-effective endeavor and that means more resources for the kids. There were some kids who took a while to kind of learn this new culture, but we have found that those kids are doing great now, you know, because kids need structure. And if you put a student who is struggling through a school who is struggling, then the kid's gonna struggle even more. I like to come down and see it when the kids are arriving. I don't go in, but it's just fun to see them. And then I hear from all kinds of people how much joy it brings them to see young kids downtown. You know, it's just very, very pleasant. Go, go, look, look, look! <laughs> Crossroads Academy, by the way, defines the boundaries of downtown for its student body as the Missouri River to Linwood, state line to Woodland. Classes for next year, including the sixth grade they'll be adding, are already filled up. There is a waiting list. Hard to believe, but this Sunday marks the 40th anniversary of the opening of Worlds of Fun. In 1973, admission was $6.95. You know, today it's twice that just to park your car. But that doesn't stop people like Randall Strong Wallace. This Worlds of Fun super fan heads to the park twice a week. And as you're about to see, his love affair with roller coasters involves more than just riding them. He calls it his coaster cave. 
In the basement of his South Kansas City home, Randall Strong Wallace is putting the finishing touches on the Zambezi Zinger. It's one of Worlds of Fun's original roller coasters. It was there when the park opened in 1973. To the dismay of fans, it was dismantled in 1997 and shipped off to a new life in Columbia, South America. Do you have an engineering background, Randall? I don't. Um, actually, I think the method that I use is called empirical engineering, which basically means that I'm, I'm for the most part, self-taught. So you're doing all this with, with no sciency background whatsoever in engineering? Actually, it's, it's, it's all gravity. Anybody that knows anything about gravity could build a model roller coaster. This is Randall's 61st working roller coaster. He's been at this a long time. Many of his models have been on exhibit at Union Station. Classic worlds of fun coasters like the Orient Express, the Scream Roller, Shush Boomer. He has captured them all in miniature form. Randall traces his addiction to his late grandmother. She knew how crazy it was about roller coasters, so she tried to make a roller coaster cake, and it fell over. Well, she had made a brown paper roller coaster car to go on the cake, so she'd saved it. She put it up on a shelf, and I saw it. I was like, Grandma, what's that? And she told me the story. She's like, but the whole thing fell apart, and I'm like, oh, no, but this is cool. Can I have the, the car? Later on uh, in life, uh, I had a big brother through the Big Brother uh, Little Brother program, and we were going to build an actual rideable backyard roller coaster, but we needed to make a scale model of it first. So he and I built my very first model, and it was a scale model out of balsa wood of this roller coaster that we were going to build. Uh, he and I never got around to it because I ended up moving up to Kansas City. I kind of combined the two things, and then from there it just kind of evolved, and eventually I figured out how to make them work. What's your favorite ride in the park? My favorite ride, hands down, well, hands up, is actually Prowler. And you're going to force me to ride this? Uh, I'm not going to force you to ride on it. You should okay. never force someone to ride a roller coaster, but I will let everyone know what a big chicken you were if you don't ride it with me. Okay, come on, let's go. Okay. Are you ready? Uh, there's no chicken's way out there's now. There's no chicken there? exit. Okay, this is right. it. All You're right, on. here we go. Here we go. Yeah, there I'm we raising go. my hands at this hands point. Up. Yes. See, it's a great ride. Did you ever ride the ZMBZ Zinger at night? I did. I love that ride. This ride is now the good night coaster. It's a lot like the Zinger. You can't really see where you're going. Oh, my God. Yeah. Okay. Are you ready? All right. 40 seconds of non-stop. Ah! Randall's basement is filled with coaster memorabilia, from old Worlds of Fun maps and pictures to the original blueprints for the Zambezi Zinger, stacks of theme park enthusiast magazines where he's authored articles, and then there are some rare artifacts for the true coaster connoisseur. And this is part of a footer from the Zambezi Zinger. And then this is a side panel from the Timberwolf. Oh. Now, it, did that fall off the uh, timber wolf? No. Oh, that's good news. Off. Like a lot of young Kansas Cityans, Randall went to work for Worlds of Fun as a teenager. But the novelty of getting to ride all the coasters for free never wore thin. Even now, in his early 40s, he's a season ticket holder and says he still tries to head out to the park twice a week. A lot of people have uh, met their partners by working at Worlds of Fun. There are so many children who owe their lives to Worlds of Fun because mom and dad met here, fell in love, got married, and they had them. Started by Lamar Hunt in 1973, Worlds of Fun was intended as just a side note attraction to a grand 500-acre entertainment and hotel corridor that was scaled back due to a lagging economy. In 1982, almost a decade after its opening, Oceans of Fun, at the time the largest water park in the world, splashed onto the sea next door. Both parks were sold to the Cedar Fair Entertainment Company in 1995. Holly, it's been 40 years now of Worlds of Fun. What's different for this anniversary year? Well, we have a lot of really neat stuff planned for this year. 
the biggest and best news is probably now that we have Worlds of Fun and Ocean Sun of Fun all in one park and all for one price. So there's no more barriers between the parks, all just one park. That is it. Also new this year is Dinosaurs Alive, an immersive encounter with 35 life-size prehistoric beasts. Yep, their tails thrash, they claw, and they roar. And you pay $5 more on top of your ticket price for the thrill. Okay. What's next? How about the mamba? Oh my goodness, all right. Ah, now this ride is more my style. This is Nick Haynes reporting from Worlds of Fun for KCPT. Oceans of Fun, by the way, opens for the season this Saturday. You can check out videos of Randall's roller coasters at his website, modelcoasters.com. Now, traditionally, Memorial Day weekend marks the official beginning of summer activities. And in Kansas City, one of the best ways to observe it will be coming up this Sunday night. That's the annual Bank of America's Celebration at the Station, featuring the Kansas City Symphony. It's a free event at Union Station, complete with fireworks to cap off the evening. But if you can't get down there, you can watch it live right here on KCPT. Every year, the orchestra plays a mix of patriotic favorites and music that artistic director Michael Stern thinks will be fitting for the occasion. They've had some great guest artists in recent years, like Mark O'Connor and Bobby Watson. This year, Kansas City's own Alita Adams will be featured with the band. The great Kansas City singer stopped by to give us an update on her musical journeys. Sunday night, you're going to be singing on a stage that's just across the street from a place where some pretty amazing things happen for you. And uh, oh, talking yes. about the signboard bar, obviously. Yes, I, since uh, I think 1975 was the first time I performed in uh, Kansas City at Crown Center at the signboard lounge. And I'll tell you, we had some amazing times, amazing times that would rival anything that I've done so, so far. And I've traveled all over the world. I've been in some pretty big arenas. Uh, I've done some very memorable things, but my heart is here in Kansas City where we had great times. Well, you were, you were playing the piano. You yes. Were, I mean, you're really a talented musician as well as a great singer, and that, that, that place must have really pushed you along to have to really you know, get there. I have to credit all of those days, those were the opportunities to hone my craft, to learn about not only the business, but the creativity of music and how to perform to an audience, not just an audience who came to hear you, but audiences that didn't come to hear you. When you have in the hotels, you know, different conventions and they have nothing to do with each other. Uh, and you're trying to please, you know, people, and not under the best situation. Well, I suppose it depends on how you look at it, but people who are under the influence of alcohol, it can go either way. And then two guys named Roland and Kurt oh. walk in. Life changes, doesn't it? And that actually happened when I moved over to the Hyatt and uh, in a little room called the Duck Club. And uh, they had performed in town at Memorial Hall, I think it was. And, um, Tears for Fears. Tears for Fears, yeah, okay, for yeah. those I, who I, don't I, know. I dropped names. But. Yes. <laughs> yes. And I guess I knew that they were there because my boyfriend at the time and drummer, uh, now husband, uh, said, you know, Tears for Fears, you know, they're here. And I, and I thought, well, that's nice. You know, we had a lot of people always come into the club and listen. And uh, they were so moved that two years later, they, they looked me up, they, they hunted me down and uh, called me and in, in 1987, they called uh, and asked me to be a part of uh, their recording, The Seeds of Love. And the song was called Woman in Chains. And it is still one of my favorite songs today. That's an incredible song, really moving. And you perform it very powerfully. Uh, Thank you. And that sort of bred 
chance to go make Circle of One, uh -huh. which of course yields a, a song that you're still identified with today. Yes, very much so. It was also the song that Circle of One is a song that Oprah used to like to work out to. <laughs> and I have to say that in uh, in 91, she invited me to be on her show mm -hmm. because someone was playing Get Here when she was taking a shower and at the studio, you know, and she came out of the shower and said, who is that? And uh, she's been really, she was very, very uh, helpful in uh, really pushing my career by uh, having me be on her show a couple of times and inviting me to be a part of some uh, private things. And it, it was really nice, it was very nice. Yeah. Well, that song will resonate nicely off the stage, I think, on Sunday night with the Memorial Day. Uh, feeling in the air because it, it it's still you know, it's got a pertinence I think I'm looking forward to that um, that song is very closely associated with uh, veterans of the wars and uh, it started out as a part of Desert Storm and it was a campaign to uh, for people to win opportunities to send messages to their loved ones in the war in 91 I've heard so many stories of people who sent messages with this song or they'd hear the song riding on a bus and their loved one was in in you know overseas in the war and uh, and the tears would just come down as well as it has moved a lot of people who have been comforted by the loss of a, a loved one I'm happy that I had that kind of hit because you can have the wrong hit well, it's going to be played with the symphony behind you. Yes. Do you do that much? Uh, occasionally. I, I've done that in, in Europe, um, particularly in Holland. Uh, mm. I've performed with uh, the Boston Pops. I look forward to that. This is my first time with the Kansas City Symphony. Can you believe that? I, w I was looking up just to make sure because I couldn't recall any time. First time. I. It's amazing, <laughs> and I've been here for a lot of years, but yeah, I'm honored. And looking out onto that sea of people, I think, is, is a very special experience. It's with the Liberty Memorial back there, Union yes. Station looks gorgeous behind you. I, trust me, from having been there before, I, I know the feeling that just that, that event brings out in people. I think they'll really enjoy your interpretation, and you're going to be singing another song or two, I believe, as well. Yes, yes, I'm looking forward to singing a song with music corps um, mm -hmm. for the uh, the war heroes who have been drastically affected mm -hmm. by the accidents that happen in war and they're recuperating and rehabilitating uh, and using um, musical therapy by playing instruments the instruments that mean the most to them and I'll be singing with them and uh, probably playing with them as well, and and the orchestra will also accompany them, and uh, a Leonard Cohen song. So we're looking forward to that. I, music is therapy, and I've seen this happen um, everywhere. How it soothes the soul, and I, I see myself as that, really that, not as uh, someone who whose goal is to be famous, but my goal is to soothe all of that, the, the storms that happen in the human beings, and that's what gives me so much pleasure. When you get to take your husband along, like you said, once the boyfriend, now the husband, drummer yes. John Cushon, who some people will remember from you know, playing with, with bands around Kansas City, too. Yes, John Cushon. Never leave home without him. <laughs> We're very, very fortunate to get a chance to travel together. That was John playing on that hit song, mm -hmm. and the, my all my records and uh, he is a great source of inspiration for me and for writing songs I get a lot of wonderful ideas from his playing and his he's got a very wonderful scope uh, it which ranges from classical to jazz and everything in between and he's probably more uh, well-rounded than I am and um, and we have a, a really fun time together.
you need to get back to that garden because this, I is, know, this is planting time. Which is why I'm trying to enjoy that now. <laughs> well, there's some good weather in store. I'm sure it's going to be beautiful on Sunday night out at uh, Union Station. Of course, people can watch it live here on KCPT as well. Starts at 8 o'clock. It'll be the symphony, a chance to hear Alita Adams. And again, we thank you so much for coming by and seeing us on the local show. Thank you so much. Speaking of music, you may have heard that KCPT will be adding something new to our operation later this year. We're acquiring the radio station 90.9 The Bridge, which plays a format known as Triple A, adult album alternative. Should be fun for listeners who haven't been able to hear much of that kind of music on the radio. Also, it will give us a chance on the TV side to sometimes share some musical talent with you in new and interesting ways. As we leave you this week, here's a taste of what that might look like. A little video with the band Fitz and the Tantrums playing live at Weights and Measures Studio in the Crossroads. See you in June. Principal funding for The Local Show provided by Francis Family Foundation, Frederick and Louise Hartwig Family Fund, Kaufman Foundation, Healthcare Foundation of Greater Kansas City, Johnson County Community College, John and Effie Spees Memorial Trust, Bank of America Trustee, Richard J. Stern Foundation for the Arts, Commerce Bank Trustee, and KCPT members, thank you.